thank you all for joining us today for our webinar on the E2 visa. Uh, my name is Dustin Saldariaga and I am a senior associate with Scott Legal PC. Uh, this webinar is really intended to meet you where you are regarding the E2 visa. So if you already know a lot about the E2 visa, we will be talking about some of the nuances of applying with a, a low investment amount or um, otherwise with a risky case. And if you don't know much about the E2 visa, we will be covering some of the, the fundamentals about the visa. Um, you may know that this visa, the E2 visa, is really um, close to our hearts as a law firm because Ian Scott, our founder, um, started the firm on an E2 visa and actually is still on an E2 visa. Um, his experience nav navigating the process really does shape how we walk our clients through the process since he really has personally seen every aspect from uh, applying at the consulate, going for the interview, all of that. So when we speak with clients, we really do keep in mind his experience um, personally. So a few things before we get started. This webinar is part of a series. We try to do at least two webinars a month on a variety of immigration topics. So we do hope that you will tune in and sign up for our future webinars if those topics are helpful to you. Um, at the end of this presentation, we'll send you a link where you can sign up for those future webinars. We'll also send you the PowerPoint that you see on your screen, as well as a comprehensive guide to the E2 visa. And in the email that we send you, we'll also send you a link to our YouTube channel. Um, we record our webinars. This webinar is being recorded and we post the full length webinars to our YouTube channel, as well as a variety of shorter videos that touch on the full range of immigration issues. Um, so as I've suggested, our firm is a full service immigration firm. And while we do focus on business immigration, uh, we regularly handle the full spectrum of immigration cases, including family based cases, green cards, non immigrant visas, student visas, et cetera, et cetera. So do check out our website, do check out our blog and do check out our YouTube channel when you get a chance. Um, we will be addressing questions during this webinar. We plan to get through all of the questions we receive. So please feel free to send those to us either through the chat function or through the Q&A function. And we will be actively monitoring those. And if we don't answer the question at the moment you ask it, we, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And I am very fortunate to have joining me for this webinar, Kelly Legrand Wiener, who is our firm's managing attorney. And Kelly will be speaking to some of the more nuanced um, uh, categories of businesses that apply for E2 visas um, in the second half of this presentation. So we look forward um, to hearing from her and, and her sharing her extensive expertise preparing these applications. So without further ado, we will go ahead and dive into the basic requirements for an E2 visa, which you see on your screen. The E2 visa, and, and to clarify, I'll be talking about the E2 investor visa, which is the visa that is necessary for someone to come to the US to develop and direct a business. There is also an E2 employee visa for someone to come to the US to work for the company. Um, that will not be the focus of this presentation, but we have information on the E2 employee visa on both our blog and our YouTube channel, so check that out. So the first requirement for an E2 investor visa is that the applicant must be a national of a treaty country. And there are dozens of E2 treaty countries. I believe right now there are more than 80 and they really do span the globe. Um, however, this is a threshold requirement. So you do need a passport from one of those 80 plus E2 countries. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, the next requirement, which is also a threshold requirement, meaning if you don't meet it, you automatically do not qualify for the visa. And if you have a visa and you fail to meet this requirement, you become uh, ineligible for, for the E2 status. But you must own at least 50% of the E2 company. Uh, that does mean that you can have a co-investor. 
Um, the co-investor can also own 50%. So if, if both individuals own 50%, that is okay. And if your co-investor has the nationality of a treaty country, you can have a company that has dual E2 nationality. Um, if you know, if you're only applying for one investor, then, then your ownership amount can span anywhere from 50% to 100%. And your co-investor really can be anyone. As, lo as long as you meet that 50% requirement, your co-owners uh, can be US citizens, they can be green card holders, they can be nationals of countries that are not E2 treaty countries. Um, again, as long as you're the only one applying for the E2 investor visa, all you need to do is own at least 50% of the company. Um, and again, that is a threshold requirement. So let's say you plan to sell some of your equity. Uh, you need to be very careful that you always have at least 50% ownership in the company. The moment it drops below 50%, you become ineligible uh, for the visa or for E2 status. So, so always keep that 50% maintained. Third, you must make an investment into the E2 company. Uh, the funds that you invest must be at risk. And what that means is that the money actually needs to have been spent on the business. It's not enough to simply transfer, transfer your funds from say, your personal checking account to a business checking account. Um, uh, that, in other words, uh, working capital is not in and of itself sufficient, you actually need to spend that money. So we'll talk about what good and bad expenditures look like, but on your screen, you, you see that there are several typical E2 expenditures listed, inventory, equipment, a website, office supplies, uh, warehouse rent, marketing, business entity setup, etc. These are really expenses that are necessary for the business to become operational. Uh, and so really most any expense that's needed for the business to become operational would be considered a good expense. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later. But the point now that that is important, uh, important to understand is that you really do need to spend those funds. Um, now, if you have spent funds, it's fine to have an additional amount that's in a business bank account that's reserved for the business as working capital. And the government will consider working capital as persuasive in an application, but working capital is not a substitute for funds that are committed. So you really do need to focus on those spent funds first and foremost. The source of the funds needs to be shown in the application. So this is, true of, of really any E2 application, uh, the government will want to see that the funds that you have invested in the business were acquired legally. Um, at a consulate, this is usually relatively easy to show. Um, most consulates have page requirements, page limits. So you really can't show, you know, hundreds of pages of documents showing where, you know, how the funds traveled from one bank account to another, your tax returns, etc. So you need to, to really focus on a few documents that show the source of funds at a consular application in most cases. If you're applying at USCIS, which is an option if you're inside the US, USCIS will basically do a, um, a financial audit of where, where your funds came from, and they will want to see documents showing every single bank account uh, that the money traveled through and exactly how you received it. So if you are applying through USCIS, um, be sure that you, you can document where your money came from that you invested into the business. Um, the next bullet you see on your screen is that the investment must be substantial. This is probably the most common question we get about the E2 visa, which is how much do I need to invest? And unfortunately, and fortunately, uh, the government doesn't give a clear answer on that. There is not a set dollar amount. I say unfortunately, because it does leave uh, some uncertainty and you know, some applicants, uh, you know, would like a bit more certainty from the government and and they do ask you know do I need to invest more do I need to invest more and oftentimes it's impossible to say with complete certainty uh, whether you know the government is going to find the amount substantial but if the amount is enough for your type of business to get started 
then in most cases it is going to be considered substantial by the government. And Kelly will talk a little bit more about this later. And when the title of this presentation is low investment uh, amount and risky cases, and oftentimes that's getting at this requirement. So you you know we really do as a firm. Um, have a focus on assisting clients who really don't have a ton of money to invest in the E2 business. And they may be starting businesses that have low uh, required investment amounts. So for example, a law firm. To start a law firm, you really only need a computer, uh, malpractice insurance, uh, access to a few websites, your own website, a very small office space. You might spend $20,000 and and be able to start your business. So what do you do in that kind of situation? That's really what we'll be talking a lot about in this presentation. Um, so so that that is both the good and the bad side of the fact that the government doesn't have a set dollar amount. The good side is you really can have a successful application with an investment amount that is $100,000 or less. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, if you do have a lower investment amount, you really do want to make sure that other requirements that I'm talking about on this slide really are clearly met. And one of those is this next bullet, bullet number four, that the business cannot be marginal. And what that means is the business must generate sufficient income to support both the applicant and their family um so it, more more than just the applicant and their family so the e2 business needs to employ at least three full-time equivalent u.s workers over the span of five years um so you know when do you need to hire those employees the earlier the better um, however, the government does not typically follow up on E2 businesses and, and, you know, the next point at which they will review how a business is doing is when you apply to renew your visa or to extend your status. So, you know, it, it is absolutely important that you employ U.S. workers before you renew your visa or extend your status. But if it does take you a year or two years to begin hiring, in many cases, that is OK. Um, mm -hmm. However, this really is a fundamental requirement. So as I mentioned before, if your application is weaker in certain aspects, so for example, if you can't invest $100,000 in your business, let's say you have $50,000 to invest in your business, one way to really strengthen that application is to use part of that 50,000 to hire a US worker before you file the application, maybe as an office manager, maybe as a website designer or a marketer, and to show the government that even though your investment amount is low, you are already paying a US worker and therefore already satisfying one of the fundamental requirements for an E2 visa. Requirement number five is that the business must be real and operating. Uh, at the time you arrive at the consulate for your visa interview, you want to be able to say to the officer that all you need is the visa and you're ready to travel to the US and for the business to become operational. What that means is you already need office space lined up. You already need to have started your marketing. Of course, you already need to have established the business as a legal entity, as an LLC or a corporation. Um, and you would include in your application documents showing that you've done those things. So you would have an executed commercial lease agreement. Uh, you'd have screenshots of your website. You'd have copies of any licenses that your business requires. And Kelly will talk about that a bit later. Um, so you really do want to show in your application that the business is ready to become operational as soon as you've received that visa. Um, now, this ties into the required investment amount. Um, in, in the documentation you would provide in your application to show the government that you have invested a substantial amount into the business, you want to show that you've bought everything that's needed for the business to be operational. Uh, so that is a good way to know, have you invested enough? If there's anything else your business needs to become operational, say a commercial lease, you want to have spent that money on that uh, item, uh, you know, and you'd want to show in your application that you've done that. The sixth requirement you see on your screen is that the E2 investor must be coming to the US solely to develop and direct the E2 enterprise. 
Uh, when you enter on an E2 visa, you have authorization to only work for the E2 company. You do not have authorization to work for any other employer. And your focus should be on growing the business. And in your application, you do want to show um, that you're qualified to do that. Usually this is a pretty low benchmark. Um, we in our applications will usually include a resume and we'll explain in the business plan how the applicant, uh, the applicant's educational and or their experience has set them up well to make this business a success. But again, uh, don't be discouraged if you don't have uh, a college degree. Don't be discouraged if you are young and this is your first business. We have seen plenty of success stories where um, you know the drive to start mm -hmm. a business really is sufficient to do that. Now, one, one quick note on this requirement is that if you're applying through USCIS, this is a, a slightly stricter requirement and what what uscis will want to see is that you as the e2 investor will not be providing direct services to clients um, that you will be hiring someone to do that you'll be hiring a u.s worker to do that and that your role will really be as the business owner and entrepreneur and i think it's helpful to use an example here so let's say that you are starting an accounting firm and um, you're applying through USCIS. A risky application would have the applicant acting as the accountant for the business for the first two years of the business's existence and only hiring a US worker in year two or year three. That's risky because it suggests that the E2 applicant, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be acting as the accountant and therefore competing with other accountants in the domestic labor force. Um, so in contrast, what you want to do is if you're applying through USCIS, say to start an accounting firm, you want to show that in year one, as early as possible, you'll be hiring a US worker to work as an accountant and you even if part time and your role will really be to grow the business, to network, to um, market, to really think strategically about how to grow the business so that you're employing more accountants. The final requirement on your screen is you must have the intent to return to your home country upon the expiration of the E2 visa. Uh, so the E2 visa is not a green card. Um, you, you know, the intent needs to be that you will only be in the US for the duration of your E2 status. So usually this is a fairly simple requirement to satisfy. We would have our clients uh, sign a statement saying that this is their intention to leave the US at the end of their status. Uh, it's worth noting, since this is a very common question we get, it is possible to adjust status from E2 status to uh, a green card. Um, however, you do need to qualify for the green card independent of the E2 visa. So in the US, we don't have a point system where say starting a business gives you a certain number of points. You really do need to qualify for the green card independently, whether that's through a family relationship or through growing your E2 business, for example, um, uh, to justify say an EB-5 green card. And we have a separate presentation, or separate webinar, full length webinar on moving from an E2 visa to a green card, uh, as well as the EB-5 green card. So do check that out if you're curious. So next we'll, we'll get a little bit deeper into a few of the requirements I talked about. Um, so let's first talk about who can apply for an E2 treaty investor visa and and that word treaty really tells you most of what you need to know here you need to hold a passport from one of the 80 plus e2 treaty countries to figure out if if your country of nationality is on the list uh simply do a google search for u.s department of state e2 treaty countries and you'll see a list of all of the E2 countries. Keep in mind that that list shows both E1 and E2 uh, treaty countries, and they're not always the same. So if you're looking at an E2 visa, make sure you're looking at, uh, at the E2 countries. Um, now, it is sufficient for you to hold a passport from an E2 treaty country. It does not matter where you were born, uh that is relevant if you're applying for a green card it's not relevant for an e2 visa so uh to take an example if you um 
uh, have lived your entire life in Uruguay, um, but which is not an E2 treaty country, but one of your parents is Italian. And through your uh, parent, you have an Italian passport, even though you have never been to Italy, that is sufficient for an E2 visa since Italy is an E2 treaty country. You only need to hold a passport. Um, in the past, this meant that you could uh, acquire citizenship in an E2 treaty country through investment. Uh, Grenada was one of the most popular options for this. Um, since March of 2022, that is still an option, but what is important to know is that you now need to actually reside in the country, uh, the E2 treaty country, for at least three years before you can apply. So if you say are a national of Brazil or South Africa or Uruguay, all of which, or China or India, all of which are not E2 treaty countries, and you acquire citizenship through Grenada, which is an E2 treaty country, you would actually need to live in Grenada for three years before you apply for the E2 visa. So obviously a very significant additional hurdle. Um, there are a number of options for obtaining an E2 visa. You can, most, most of what I've been saying so far has kind of assumed that you're starting a business, uh, but that's not the only option. You can purchase an existing business in the US um, or you can start a franchise in the US. And those really are the three most common pathways that we see. Uh, most common is probably starting your own business. Second most common is purchasing an existing business. Third most common is starting a franchise. Um, if you are purchasing an existing business in the US, a few things to be mindful of are, first of all, try to find a business that already employs US workers. Um, because if you are applying based on a business that has not employed US workers, uh, and let's say it's been operational for a decade, you will have a hard time explaining why you will now turn the business around so that it actually does start employing US workers. Much easier would be to find a business that employs at least three US workers, and then you can show the government that you're simply gonna continue this successful track record of employment, uh, which again is one of the fundamental requirements for an E2 visa. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how to factor in the, the investment amount when purchasing a business in the next slide, I believe. Uh, so I'll just bookmark that here real quick. Um, I already talked about the fact that there must be a treaty between the US and the treaty country. So let's finally talk about this last bullet. How long is the E2 visa valid for? Um, there is something called reciprocity. The treaty between the US and the treaty country will, um, or, or the terms of the agreement will define how long the, um, the visa is for. And if, if the foreign country limits the validity period for a US citizen, the reciprocity will, re will result in a shorter period for the foreign national. So this spans between three months and five mm -hmm. years. Um, uh, there are certain strategies if you are from a country uh, or have a passport from a country with a three month limit, um, you know, you, you may very well change status inside the US, but regardless of uh, the validity period of the visa, each time you enter the US on the visa, you will be given two years of status in most cases. So uh, that's true, even if you enter on the last day of your visa validity period, you will get two years of status. So, so do keep that in mind. So how much investment is enough? I've, I've already touched on this quite a bit. Uh, the investment amount must be substantial. There's no set dollar amount. It really does depend on the type of business. So if you're starting a law firm or a consulting firm, a service-based business, the investment amount may be uh, far less than if you're starting, say, a manufacturing company where you have to invest in machinery. Um, and the government will want to see, again, that you have invested enough to make the business operational. Now, there's something called the proportionality test, which basically says that if you're starting a business that requires a lower investment amount to get started, you're expected to invest 100% of that amount. If you're starting a business that requires far more uh, investment, such as a manufacturing company, you may not be required to invest 100%. So if the business requires a $10 million investment, the government may be fine with you investing 7 million of that 10 million. So that, that's all the proportionality test says. 
for our purposes, you know, again, many, the vast majority of our clients uh, are applying with a relatively low investment amount, are, start, are starting businesses that don't require a large investment amount. So we would, uh, in the vast majority of cases, encourage our clients to invest everything that's needed to start the business, 100% of the amount. Um, and if you are buying a business, then usually the fair market value so when you're buying a business usually it's through a broker uh or you know the seller is advertising the business on the open market if you can show you're buying the fair market value of the business that is usually sufficient um so so you know when one you know we do sometimes see families uh selling businesses internal internally you do want to be careful there to show that the applicant really is paying the fair market value And um, I've touched on this as well. Uh, so, so strategies to deal with a low dollar amount. Um, really, the most important thing to keep in mind is that the government will look at the application holistically. They're going to look at all of the requirements that we listed on, on the first slide. So a low investment amount is just one aspect of an application. It's, it's, and again, the government defines the term vaguely, saying it only needs to be a substantial amount. So if you can show that you have invested a substantial amount by getting the business operational with the amount you've invested and starting to employ U.S. workers, that's great. If you can't hire U.S. workers, you might um, you might get letters from prospective clients saying that they are eager to do business with you. Um, showing that there's real demand for your products or services. You might get letters from your local chamber of commerce saying, uh, talking about the local economy and how a business like the one you want to start will have a positive impact. Um, and, and finally, a strong business plan can be key here. If you're starting a business, we would almost always recommend a business plan. And even if you're purchasing a business, a business plan can be important to show your trajectory over the next few years to show how the revenue you'll generate will lead to the employment of U.S. workers. You see a couple examples on your screen. I'm not going to spend too much time with them, but really they just illustrate the two ends of the spectrum. So example one, uh, you're opening a business, low investment amount, but you've already hired some U.S. employees and you're already taking revenue. Maybe one of those employees is a manager for your U.S. business. And so you don't actually need to be in the U.S. to generate revenue through the company. That could very well be a strong application in spite of a low investment amount. Example two, though, uh, low investment amount. You don't want to invest anymore or you can't invest anymore. You don't want to or cannot hire anyone in the U.S. until the E-2 visa is approved. That is a very risky case. So do what you can to show that the application is otherwise strong, even if your investment amount is low. And very quickly, common E-2 visa expenditures are really those that are needed for the business to be operational. So uh, furniture, efforts to market the business, such as a website, social media ads, um, any licenses you need, inventory, if you can employ independent contractors or employees before you apply, that's great. Um, you know, a car or a truck, only if it's required for the business. Um, weak or bad expenditures are those such as coming expenditures needed to find the business. So if you fly to the U.S. to look at a few businesses, don't include your flight costs, don't include your hotel. This is a visa not meant to find a business. It's really meant to come to the U.S. to develop and direct a business. Um, and the government's not going to want to see your expenses to, to find that business. They really want to see you spending money to get the business operational. Um, so I, I think that's sufficient for, for that slide. But if you have questions, do set up a consultation. We can always talk through that. Um, and I already went through this. So be careful with expenses paid to related parties, such as family members. You always want to show clear documentation that you paid the fair market value for any significant asset. Uh, if you're buying from a, a family member, um, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a consular officer um you know if if your friend comes to you and says to you hey i'm thinking about moving to the us to start a business and you're not sure if they're serious about it 
and they tell you, you know, yeah, I paid my brother to buy his convenience store. Um, and they tell you, you know, you got a great deal on the, they can't got a great deal on the, the convenience store, store. You're going to be skeptical and a consular officer would be skeptical too. So consular officers are human and, uh, you know, uh, you want to make sure that what you're doing is, is clearly convincing to them that you're serious about the business you're starting. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Kelly to talk about a few uniquely challenging categories of uh, E2 applications. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you for that great introduction to, um, to E2s and also just, uh, you know, how we approach the investment amount. Um, you know, I think some of what you have already covered is also discussed on this slide. Um, so we can talk a little bit about how that plays out for different types of, um, you know, common E2 businesses. So I think, you know, we really do see a lot of clients that are getting E2s for consulting businesses. Um, that being said, I think they are a risky category for many reasons. Um, you know, so one is that, you know, theoretically, you could start a consulting business with a very low investment. It's very, very common that our clients come to us and say, I have the expertise. Um, I've worked in this industry. I already know people that want to work, you know, with me and I have a computer, you know, I, what else do I need? I really don't need anything else. Um, and so while that may be true from kind of a business perspective, from the visa and immigration perspective, you know, ultimately you do need to invest more as this is a treaty investor visa. So, um, you know, in terms of thinking about, you know, what would the consular officer want to see, um, you know, you want to spend money on things that show that you are committed to operating this business so that, you know, if, if money is just in a business bank account and you, you know, come into the U.S. and maybe things don't go as you planned, you know, their concern is you could just take that money you know, and leave the United States. Um, and now you have a five-year visa stamp or, you know, many countries will have a five-year visa stamp. So, you know, some things that you can do to show that you are, um, you have, you know, irrevocably committed a substantial amount, uh, you know, you can prepay for office space. So, you know, six months or even 12 months, um, you know, you can invest in equipment. Uh, so let's say that, you know, you um, plan to hire four employees and normally you would buy those computers, you know, or equipment at the time you hire the employees. However, perhaps you invest in the equipment early uh, because it does help, you know, with your visa application. Similarly, perhaps you could get started without even any website or with a very bare bones website or very few marketing materials because you already have some connections in the industry. But perhaps you invest in that, you know, marketing ahead of time, uh, again, because it's helpful for your business down the road and because it's necessary in order to get the E2 visa. Um, another way you can, you know, increase your expenditures is to hire employees. And so this works on a couple of levels, you know, so, um, you know, one is that consulting businesses are risky, partly because officers are concerned that someone is going to come into the United States and just operate as a solo consultant. And that is not what the E2 visa is for. The E2 visa, um, you know, is meant to show that you <clears throat> are starting a business that's not marginal, that is going to support more than just the investor and their family. And so, um, you know, by hiring an employee ahead of time, you can pay that employee um, and that increases your investment amount. Um, if you pay for insurance, if you pay for a payroll provider, all those expenses can also be included to bolster your investment. And then as well, you're also helping with the marginality requirement. So you're increasing your investment by, um, you know, spending money on employees. And you're also showing, um, you know, that the business is going to hire U.S. workers, is not going to be a marginal enterprise. So that's, I think, a very helpful thing, um, you know, for a consulting business, um, just given that there is some concern about that. I think another, you know, kind of tip for consulting businesses is you want to be able to show that you really have clients lined up, um, you know, that there are people who are interested in working with your company. Um, you know, I think that there's lots of consulting consultants out there, lots of consulting businesses and showing that you actually have, um, you know, real interest from clients, you know, either contract or letters of intent, um, you know, those can be really helpful for these types of applications. So let's look at another very common and also very, um, I'd say, risky type of um, uh, E2, you know, company, which is real estate. So, um, you know, real estate, you know, we'll just say real estate holding companies do not qualify. 
Um, it's on many consulate websites um, under the FAQs where it says, no, you cannot get an E2 visa by purchasing a property in the United States. So I think, um, you know, very frequently consulates are concerned that people think that it's okay to just purchase a property um, and perhaps have some type of passive real estate income. You know, maybe you rent out one property, or maybe you just own a property. So none of those things are considered to be kind of real and operating, um, you know, enough that they could count as E2 businesses. Uh, so really when you're talking about real estate, one challenge is just to demonstrate that you will have a real and operating business. This is not just an idle or speculative investment. Um, that you're, you know, that's just kind of a, you know, real estate ownership. Um, so, you know, some some uh, clients of ours, many clients of ours do do real estate successfully, but, um, you know, you need to make sure that you're speaking to that concern that they have about, you know, the company being real and operating. So, for example, um, you know, a real estate brokerage firm, real estate, you know, property management company, um, if you are doing any type of renovation or construction, um, all of those are viable ideas that clients of ours have done um, and gotten the E2 visa for. Um, you know, I, I, the other thing we have on here is house flipping. So I think that house flipping sometimes can work, but only if it's on a very large scale. So if you just, if you've purchased one home and you're fixing it up to sell, that's generally not going to be kind of on a large enough scale that, you um, you know, the consulate's going to be happy or, or satisfied. This is a real and operating company. Um, you know, contrast that to we have some clients who, you know, had 30 or 40 homes in their real estate portfolio that they were all in various, you know, states of kind of fixing up and renting out and selling. So when you have that amount of activity going through and you're hiring lots of workers to deal with that, that starts to look more like the type of real and operating business they're going to be happy with. Um, other things to consider for real estate is that it's often a very regulated industry. So if you are selling real estate, um, you know, if you are working in construction, you know, these are industries that often require licenses of some kind, and the licenses can vary state to state. Uh, so very important to do your research on that, you know, make sure that you are aware of what is required in the industry and that you've done kind of your due diligence to figure out um, you know, can I get this license ahead of time? Or perhaps I can contract with somebody who has this license until I can get mine. But you need to have a plan for that, um, you know, before you go to the consulate um, to make sure that you will actually be able to offer these services, you know, if you get the visa. So then looking at, um, I think, you know, another type of company that um, can work for an E2, but is somewhat risky. So E2 visas for equity trading companies. So I think similar to the concern officers have about real estate, um, you know, there's a concern of, are you just taking a stock portfolio, um, placing it, you know, in an LLC and, um, you know, doing passive trading and then trying to call it, um, you know, an E2 company or get an E2 for that business. So, you know, generally, you know, very similar to real estate, some of it's going to be kind of the volume um, you know, what size, um, you know, are, you know, is your company, you know, are, are you kind of working uh, with people beyond friends and family? Do you actually have, you know, interest, um, you know, from outside clients? And then as well, this is a very highly regulated industry. So do you have the proper licenses to be doing what you're doing? Have you set up the appropriate structure? Oftentimes, especially, you know, different types of financial or hedge funds, there's going to be various companies with various structures. You need to make sure that you've set that up in a way that's compliant, um, you know, with the law and the place that you're going to operate. Um, so something that's just very, um, I think, important to, to know ahead of time when you're starting this type of company. So let's talk a little bit about reasons for E2 denials. Um, you know, so one is, you know, low investment amount. Uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, Dustin has talked about this a bit, a bit earlier in the presentation, but just many, you know, this presentation is about low investment amount and risky cases. So, you know, if you um, have a very low investment amount, you really need to be doing everything possible to strengthen every other aspect of your case, right? You want to have a really strong business plan. If you can hire an employee, that's a great idea to do. You should have, you know, letters from potential clients or customers interested in your product or service. Uh, you know, perhaps you've made um, contact with the local chamber of commerce and you've gotten a letter of support from them. So everything extra you can do to bolster the other parts of the case, it's very important to do when you have a low investment amount. 
Um, you may also decide you want to speak to um, you know, a CPA who perhaps works in your industry who can look at your business plan and investment and maybe opine on whether or not this was a substantial amount. Um, you can also include uh, market research reports or industry publications that support that you spent everything necessary to set up this type of business. Um, so all of those things are very important um, you know, to try to avoid denials for low investment amount. Um, so other reasons for denials, you know, nature of the business, you know, we just talked about this, there's just certain industries where, um, you know, officers are going to look more closely, it's going to be riskier. Um, so if you're in one of those industries, you want to make sure, again, you're strengthening all the other parts of your application. Um, another is filing location, you know, venue. So important to think about this and talk about this with your lawyer. Um, you know, if you have a very, very low investment amount, um, you know, perhaps filing with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services as a change of status might be favorable to you uh, because they do accept much lower investment amounts. However, if you have a very complex or complicated source and trail of funds, filing with USCIS for a change of status is generally not a good idea because they have a very strict, you know, view of the source and trail of funds. Um, so you really want to be thinking about where you applying? Um, are you applying somewhere that, you know, they expect to see a higher investment amount? Um, you know, what can you bring to the application? Um, you know, so another, these, these next two are kind of related. So have you run a business in your home country and not hired employees? And um, really that speaks to the concern of, are you going to create jobs for U.S. workers? So again, I think this comes up a lot in consultant cases where there's just a concern that you're going to try to enter and, and work as a solo consultant. Um, so, you know, if there is that concern, if you have kind of red flags for your application on this, or you ran a business in your home country and never hired anyone, um, probably a better idea for you to hire someone before you file. It's not a requirement, but definitely would strengthen the case. Um, you know, so another is, you know, issues with the adjudicating officer. Um, consular officers are human beings. Um, you know, some of them have, you know, kind of good days and bad days. They also have different levels of training, um, different approaches to, you know, to what the law is and what the requirements are. Um, you know, if you are in a situation where the officer is, is rude or, um, you know, you're having issues with the officer, you don't feel like it's going well, you know, we always recommend you want to be as polite as possible. They do have complete discretion over whether to grant the visa or not. Um, but you also want to ask them, you know, what are they unhappy with? Um, you know, sometimes they won't tell you, um, you know, but sometimes they will. And that can provide great insight um, to potentially allow you to reapply. Because even if you're denied, there's nothing that prevents you from reapplying. And many consulates will also try to give you a different officer um, than the one that you previously saw. So that's not a requirement, um, you know, not something they're required to do. But as a courtesy, many of them do try to do that. Um, you know, another reason for denial, you know, if you just didn't meet the requirements at the time of filing. So, for example, we had, you know, a client that came to us, they applied on their own, they put $98,000 in a business bank account and spent $2,000. So they just did not meet the requirements um, for a substantial investment, you know, $98,000 in a business bank account, none of that was committed to any particular expenses. Um, we were able to work with them, you know, they got the investment amount up closer to 50000 spent and ultimately they were approved. Let's talk a little bit about some adjudication trends, um, you know, so COVID and the E2 visa and ongoing impacts. Um, you know, I think that thankfully this is starting to fade into the background more and more. Um, however, it is still, you know, part of the E2 landscape. Um, I'd say that, you know, uh, the ongoing impacts we're seeing are just there are certain consulates that are still, you know, kind of getting back on their feet in terms of visa processing generally. So uh, there was a lot of turnover of officers during COVID, um, a lot of changed procedures, a lot of, you know, applications that just got put into a backlog. Um, so we are still seeing kind of um, issues with certain consulates where things are perhaps a bit slower um, or appointments are not available as, 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 you know, as fast as they once were. Uh, many consulates are kind of back up and running relatively efficiently, uh, maybe not quite as fast as they were pre-pandemic. But so, for example, in Toronto and London and Frankfurt, um, you know, you know, these are consulates in Japan. You know, these are consulates where generally um, E2 visas are being processed and being processed quite efficiently. Um, but there are, I think, still somewhat, you know, delays in appointment availability that are a bit longer than they used to be. Um, on the question of you know, are consulates currently processing E2 petitions, the vast majority of them are. Um, there are some that are still very, very slow. Bogota comes to mind. You know, this is one where they're they're just 
now saying that they're starting to clear the backlog, but, um, you know, getting an appointment, getting an appointment quickly, none of that is likely to happen in kind of the near future. Um, so most consulates, I'd say, are processing E2 visas. Um, the timelines are just they vary, you know, wildly between consulates, you know, perhaps, you know, in Toronto, where they may review your petition within about 10 business days, and you might get an appointment within one to two months. Um, that's, you know, what currently is there. Um, and, you know, whereas in Turkey, you know, it may take a year to get an appointment. So it's just very, very all over the place. Definitely important to talk to your attorney to understand, you know, where your options are for applying and what the timelines are, um, because they're just changing all the time. Um, you know, if you are in a situation where you're already in the United States, um, you may consider extending your status if you're already in E2 status. Um, one thing to consider there is if you were initially approved at a consulate and you want to extend your status, uh, USCIS can still ask to see all the initial proof. So all the proof of the source of funds, all the proof of the investment. Um, you know, they won't necessarily rely on anything that the consulate previously approved. They'll look at it as a new application. Um, and so when we look at that USCIS versus the consulate where to apply, say most of the time we are advising our clients to apply um, with the consulate. The reason being that you can get a visa stamp in your passport that allows you to travel internationally. Um, whereas if you get an approval with USCIS, you are not able to travel internationally. Once you travel outside the United States, uh, you would need to go to a consulate and get a visa stamp before you'd be permitted to return. And when you go to the consulate, they'll review your E2 application as a brand new application. So, you know, oftentimes we're, we're recommending the consulate. However, um, you know, more and more during COVID, you know, people were filing with USCIS, partly because the ability to travel was, you know, much more difficult, um, you know, just sometimes, you know, the the consulate didn't have availability in time. So it is important to know that extending your status or changing your status, um, you know, if you're here on a valid status, uh, you know, is potentially possible, um, you know, but there are considerations such as, you know, USCIS will take a very close look at the source and trail of funds. They'll want a dollar for dollar accounting. So if the way you earned your money um, was very complicated or you transferred it through many different accounts, it may be difficult to prove that. Um, however, USCIS is also more open to low investment amounts. So there, you know, there are pros and cons and important to discuss with your attorney to understand. All right, so let's talk about some other areas with E2s that are, you know, so one is, do I have to hire employees before I apply? So we talked about this. So no, it's not a requirement, uh, but it does strengthen your petition significantly if it's possible. Um, so, you know, uh, another thing we've, I think, also gone over, just complicated source and trail of funds for USCIS filings. Um, you know, if you have, like, let's say that you got a loan, um, you know, from a private lender, um, you know, that wasn't a bank or wasn't a financial institution, it was a friend or, or something like that, or you got a gift. Um, so you would include the loan agreement or you include the gift letter, but you would also have to go beyond that and ask where did the, you know, where did the lender get their money? You know, where did the gift giver get their money? Um, if you're getting a loan from a financial institution like a bank, then obviously, you know, you, you don't need to inquire further. But if it's a private, you know, individual lender, then you would need to ask where did they actually get that money and then provide proof to the government of where you got that money. Um, another thing that can come up is, you know, can you get E2 visas for two investors? Um, and yes, you can. Um, if you want, both want to be investors, then the ownership needs to be 50-50. Um, if you, um, if people are kind of of the same nationality, so let's say it's, you know, two Canadians and they want to own the business 70-30, um, the 70% you know, owner could be the investor and the 30% owner could be an E2 employee. But if they both want to be investors, it needs to be 50-50. Um, or let's say they don't have the same nationalities. One person's Canadian and one person, you know, is from Spain. Um, you know, in that instance, the only option is they would own it 50-50. Uh, so another thing to consider is just um, changes to the E2 business after filing. So if there's any change in ownership, if your ownership drops below 50%, you know, this can um, mean that you're out of status, that you're no longer maintaining your E2 status because the company needs to be at least 50% owned by treaty country nationals to qualify. Um, another is change in the type of business. You know, let's say that you're running a restaurant and you the restaurant's not going well and you want to close it down and become a wedding photographer. Um, so you cannot just 
stop running the restaurant and become a wedding photographer under the same LLC without talking to the consulate or USCIS first. So those substantive changes, changes to what the business is really doing, do need to be reported. Um, and um, you either need to get approval from the consulate or USCIS before you proceed with that. Um, let's say that the change is kind of a natural outgrowth of what the business was doing. Perhaps you were um, a marketing consultancy and you plan to focus on financial clients, but instead you ended up getting a ton of technology clients. Um, you know, that's fine. That's really not a substantive change, right? You're, you're at that point, you're really still doing what you said you were going to be doing. You're doing marketing, but you're just doing it for a different subset of clients. Or perhaps let's say you're a wedding photographer and you also want to start now a blog talking about kind of wedding products. See, those th types of things likely you don't need to report or go back to the consulate or USCIS because it's really more of a natural outgrowth of the type of work you're doing. But if the type of business has completely changed, you do need to get an approval first. Um, and then another family business purchases. I think Dustin talked about this a little bit also with kind of payments to related, uh, you know, re related people. If you're going to purchase a business from a family member, you know, you need to make sure that you have some type of objective third party valuation um, so that it's clear that you paid a fair market value for the business. Um, additionally, you know, you could not have you know, let's say you're purchasing a business from your brother, your brother cannot gift you the money to purchase the business from him. Um, you know, you need to be putting your own personal funds at risk. And if um, in that type of situation where, you know, you're purchasing a business from someone, but they're gifting you the money, it doesn't really feel like there's any money at risk there. Money is just going, you know, um, staying really with the gift giver in that scenario. So family business purchases, while possible, are risky and something you want to discuss with the attorney just to make sure that you're documenting that the amount that you're paying um, really is the fair market value for the business and that the money is coming, you know, from your personal funds. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, just a quick reminder to those of you who are attending, please do send in your questions. Um, we have a few minutes and no questions have, have come in yet, but I, I did want to quickly add um, that a common question we get is about renewing the E2 visa. So I just wanted to quickly say that even though um, you know, the visa validity period is three months to five years, depending on your country of nationality, you can renew the visa indefinitely as long as you remain eligible and your, and your business remains eligible. Um, I see that someone has raised their hand. Please do go ahead and, and type in your question through the chat box or the, the Q&A box if you could. Um, all right, Kelly, I think we're going to need more details on this question that came in. Um, can my sister gift me money? Um, I assume that means let's let's assume it means to purchase another business or maybe to start a startup. But then let's also talk about if, if you're using the money to buy a business from the sister. Yeah. So so if um, if if you're trying to buy a business from your sister, then no, your sister should not gift you money. If you're asking, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to start up my own business or I want to purchase a business from someone else not related to, then yes, your sister can gift you money. However, the sister will need to provide proof of where she got that money, that she got that money from a legitimate source. So if it's personal savings from employment, that's tax returns. Let's say she sold a sold a piece of property, be the purchase sale agreement and the proof of receiving the funds. So yes, um, you know, but you'd still need to show how you got that money. Um Perfect. And uh, Kelly, thoughts on how many employees to hire? Um, so we, we I think there's not a um, specific number that's required. We generally recommend three to four full-time employees by year five um, as showing that you meet the marginality requirement. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So this, this is an interesting question. Uh, can you suggest any type of business as I am Canadian? Um, so the type of business that uh, we would typically recommend is one that employs U.S. workers. So as long as you have a business that is going to employ U.S. workers, um, as we've talked about in the presentation, um, and, you know, that requires that you invest funds um, and that meets the requirements that we listed on, on the first page, you know, there, there really are very few restrictions. I would make the exception of the types of businesses that Kelly talked about, um, you know, the equity investing, the real estate investing businesses, those are going to raise flags and Kelly talked pretty extensively about those. Uh, the final category of businesses that I would say 
do not pursue if you want an E2 visa are those that are prohibited under US federal law, which in, includes cannabis and marijuana. Um, but other than that, your options are really, really varied. And if you're having a hard time deciding, um, I think franchises can be helpful. So franchises, you know, offer kind of a, a runway where, uh, you know, it's a proven track record many times. Um, so that can be worth considering. Let's see. So Kelly, this is an interesting question. What's the lowest budget you've seen approvals for, for an E2 visa for a service business? So um, I think I've seen one as low as around, um, you know, 35,000 with, and this was with USCIS though, this was not at a consulate. Um, you know, I think at a consulate, um, you know, much more, uh, you know, while I've seen lower ones over the years, I'd say currently, you know, the ones that they're looking at, you know, somewhere around 40,000 spent and around 60,000 invested is really the lowest, um, you know, I feel you know, comfortable with, um, you know, but yeah, I have seen 35,000 with USCIS. However, that's the type of case where, as we said previously, you have all these other strong aspects. You have, you know, really, you know, experienced individual, you know, as the investor, you have, you know, client contracts, you have support from local business organizations. Um, and then, you know, all that money was actually spent as well. Perfect. And a couple of questions have come in about the employment requirements. So again, you do need to employ US workers. They do not need to employ be employed before you apply, uh, but you do need to show the government how you'll employ at least three full-time equivalent US workers within five years of operations. And when we say employees, they do not need to be US citizens. So US workers can be US citizens, green card holders, or those who are in the US on non-immigrant visas, but have work authorization. Um, people who cannot be included toward that number include uh, family members and the investor, him or herself. So you'd wanna exclude those from the number. Let's see, um, there are a few questions. Uh, this is a great question, very timely. Um, if we do, so I saw a question come in, what is the suggested investment amount? So I just refer you to the what we discussed before. We have a few slides on that question and what the government means, means by a substantial amount. Um, if we do premium processing on a change of status through USCIS and you have de dependents, are they going to receive a decision at the same time? Kelly, do you want to respond to that? Sure. So, so no, um, it's not, it's not guaranteed that that will happen. Um, re, like anecdotally, there has been a recent change where USCIS is now um, starting to process uh, the E2 dependents together. Um, however, that's, uh, again, just anecdotally, they haven't kind of, um, uh, you know, said that they will automatically do that by paying for premium processing. You're not guaranteeing that you'll get that dependent change at the same, same time. Um, but they have made that change recently for H and L's, H and L dependents. And so because of that, um, I think they were starting to also see it for ease, but they have not officially said anything as to, um, you know, them guaranteeing that they will do that. Yeah, it's a really frustrating aspect of the application process through USCIS. Um, a great question came in about, so the question is, I'm in my home country. Um, my plan is to change status. Can I start working on opening the business uh, before entering into US for change of status? So there, there, there are a few things wrapped up in that question. The first is, you can only ch apply for a change of status if you're physically inside the US. And uh, I would not recommend that you enter into the US with the explicit desire to change status because when you enter, you need to represent that you're entering into a status that's consistent with the status you have when you enter. So for example, if you're entering as a recreational visitor, that needs to be your intention. Uh, but that being said, it is possible to change status from one non-immigrant status, such as a visitor status, to E2 status. Um, and it is also possible to directly respond to your question to start developing the business, whether you're inside the U.S. in another status or outside the U.S. If you're outside the U.S., it's actually 
pretty um, simple from an immigration standpoint because you you can't violate U.S. immigration laws by and large if you're not inside the U.S. So you you could hire someone to help you set up the business in the U.S. You could open a bank account from abroad. Uh, it really can help to have someone, even an independent contractor, inside the U.S. to help you get a business space, open a bank account, etc. So that could be help, helpful. If you're inside the US, you need to be very careful that you don't cross the line from what's called authorized business activities to unauthorized work. So you are able, if you're in B1 visitor status, for example, or ESTA, you're able to open a bank account, you're able to sign a commercial lease, you are not able to work. So you want to have a very clear distinction there and talk to an attorney if you're confused at all about the difference. Um, but the answer is you can set up a business in another status before you actually apply for the E2. Kelly, were there any other questions you saw that rolled in? Uh, someone's asking if they can get a loan in their home country invest. I mean, yes, you can. Um, as long as the loan is not secured by the assets of the E2 business and you have you know, either the lender is a financial institution or, you know, private lender and they can provide, you know, the proof of the funds. And yes, that's fine. Um, someone's asking about um, our fees for the E2. So please, you know, go ahead and, you know, contact us and we're happy to, you know, discuss our fees. Um, and someone's asking about, um, you know, entering on what status, you know, I think you answered that, you know, which is you need to enter with your, you know, intent um, for the particular status. That being said, you know, many people will enter to investigate E2 opportunities on B1 business visitor status. Um, but, you know, coming in with the explicit intent to change status is, is not, you know, not, not a viable approach. Great. Well, Kelly, thank you to our audience. Thank you so much for the, the great questions. Um, do keep an eye out for the email uh, that we'll be sending you momentarily, um, and we hope to see you on future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.